Good morning, everyone. My name is Ian Glass, and I would like to welcome you to the first webinar in the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture Policy Committee's webinar series. Uh, we're having some uh, technical issues, so the slideshow is supposed to show you before today's uh, webinar won't be shown. Uh, I'll go. I'll go right into introducing you to today's uh, presenter. Paul Thurgood is the Prairie Regional Agrologist for Ducks Unlimited Canada, and he'll be giving today's uh, presentation on the historical pr uh, crop production of the Canadian prairies, and then examines the very cr various cropping alternatives from a sustainability uh, perspective. Paul brings a unique perspective to this topic through his leadership in, of DUC's agricultural programs. As DUC's primary liaison with the agricultural industry in Canada, but also as an owner operator of a grain farm near Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Uh, Paul, uh, please uh, start your presentation when you're ready. All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, if you can't, um, I think Ian's going to try and get a hold of me by cell phone. And this presentation is one that I've uh, I, I originally built for, uh, for presentations to the ag industry, and I've delivered it to um, several groups, all the way from uh, guest lectures at uh, the University of Manitoba and University of Saskatchewan with uh, the ag colleges, as well as uh, Ministry of Ag in Saskatchewan and a few uh, various industry groups. And I find it it's two of my favorite things, conservation and agriculture, so it, it's uh, certainly, um, I hope that you find it half as interesting as I do. Uh, the picture you see here is uh, out the window of my combine, where one of the rare instances where I actually got to drive it. And this is our home farm, which you see is flat, heavy clay. Uh, we farm uh, west of uh, Regina. Um, and you see in the distance, there's uh, some hills there. That's the Missouri Coteau. And uh, we farm land down to, uh, right to the edge of the Coteau, which is not flat, heavy clay. So kind of have some experience farming. Nice uh, farmable flatland and uh, some hills and, and all that sort of thing that is maybe a little less farmable, but uh, has some other values. Um, the presentation today is going to look at um, crop production, as Ian mentioned, um, kind of from a, a sustainability perspective, and uh, hopefully uh, provoke some thought. Um, and I really view sustainability as something of a, a journey, not as a, gee, we get to a spot and we're sustainable, because um, we would look at, at uh, the way we've done things 20 years ago, 100 years ago, based on the best information of the day, probably people would have considered it to be sustainable. But as we learn more things, um, it means we should probably change how we do things. So uh, sustainability, uh, I think most of us probably uh, have heard the term. Uh, just to give us all a common grounding, um, when I say sustainability, I mean the convergence of societal values, economic values, and, and environmental values. And uh, you know, too often we see um, uh, things being done that are economically viable, but maybe bad for the environment or in the interest of society, but not economical. Um, and really the, the sustainability model looks for the convergence of societal, economic, and environmental values. Um, I, I think uh, to kind of get us all on, on the same ground, um, when we look at the world population today, um, and I actually just updated this number this morning. Um, UN estimates about 7.6 billion people. Last year it was 7.4 billion people. Um, this number also changed uh, the projected uh, population of the Earth by uh, 2050 was 9.6 billion last year, now it's 9.8 billion. And I think those numbers are really important for us to keep in mind um, as, as I go through the discussion because um, when we, we had a discussion with uh, ag industry and, and a few NGOs, and one of the things that we did was have uh, Bob Sanford from the UN uh, Water University come in and, and help us get a common grounding. Because often, you know, people will wander off into, well, really it's a food distribution problem, not a, a food, food quantity problem, or there's a lot of food waste, maybe we can resolve uh, the, the demand for more food through those means. And, and really the reality is probably no one in Canada can, can resolve those issues. So really we are a, a taker on this situation rather than a, a, a dictator. 
Um, so we need to, to probably live within those parameters. Another thing that, that is, uh, um, you hate to say it's a problem because probably all of us have a well-stocked refrigerator and are not concerned about where our next meal comes from. But in many parts of the world, we see uh, increasing wealth. And with increasing wealth becomes, becomes uh, better eating and more eating. So uh, that also is going to place uh, an increased demand on, on agricultural products around the world. And based on those, uh, those uh, parameters, the UN estimates that there will be 70 to 100 percent increase in demand for food by 2050, which is just absolutely staggering, and, and most of us have trouble imagining that. And you know, if, if that's not a big enough challenge to think about producing, you know, double what we produce today, I think when we look through a sustainability lens and say, okay, we need to meet the world demand for food, but we also need to have farmers, and I would argue the whole ag industry, be profitable fulfill that sustainability model while also protecting our environment. We go, ooh, okay, that makes that 70 to 100 percent increase all that more challenging. Well, let's have a look at, at history to inform the future. And uh, this picture I have adopted as uh, my great granddad did not take a selfie while he was out uh, homesteading our, our farm, but I, I've adopted this picture to represent my great grandfather. Um, our farm was homesteaded in 1904, and this would be very typical for prairie agriculture, you know, through the late 1800s, early 1900s, where, you know, a single bottom plow following horses and turning the entire topsoil over um, as part of crop production. What that production system did was um, basically allowed us to mine the nutrients that had been sequestered there um, by the grassland that had been growing since the beginning of time. And uh, that mining released nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients which were exported around the world to, uh, to produce food. And unfortunately, that, that production system also had a, a, took a, a toll on our soil resource. Um, by turning the entire soil over, uh, it exposed the, the soil to the wind, and it also broke down some of that structure that had developed in the soil because soil particles are held together in, in things called aggregates, which um, which are resistant to erosion, but roots and, and fungal mycelia and, and other things hold that soil together. And by, by tilling it, we break that, uh, that structure down. Fast forward, and this picture I've adopted to uh, represent my dad farming in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, where really a lot of things hadn't changed. Um, the amount of crop protection products used were still pretty low. Um, we, there was very little use of, of uh, synthetic fertilizers. And we were still mining our soil resource, uh, tilling anywhere between a third and a half of the land on the prairies uh, in summer fall, basically as an exercise to, to mineralize organic material to release nutrients that we could grow into a crop and then again export around the world. And um, one of the things that that did was really the, the images of soil degradation and soil erosion like you see here, really the only thing that changes is that this is a color picture and the pictures from the the previous uh, generation of farming were in black and white. But uh, really, uh, I, by today's standards, an, an unsustainable farming system, uh, from a soil resource perspective in particular, was, uh, was the norm. And uh, this is one of my honesty photos. This is uh, our farm, our family's original homestead, which is now just an abandoned yard state. But uh, the tree row that you see running on the left side of the photo is uh, the shelter belt on the west side of the yard. And that, uh, that drift of topsoil is anywhere from five to seven feet deep. And uh, the lost productivity that we see there is, is kind of a sobering thing that, that uh, you know, whenever I go buy it in a piece of farm equipment, I almost always think about the impact that we've had on, on our farm from a soil quality and a productivity perspective. Uh, today, uh, most of prairie agriculture uh, is farmed under no-till. This is a picture of uh, some water wheat that I seeded last last fall, and uh, our, we uh, we control our weeds with uh, crop protection products. We replace the nutrients that uh, we export in food uh, by synthetic fertilizers, and really happily, soil erosion is, is something uh, of the past on most farms in the prairies today. Not all of them, but most of them. So, to kind of jump off the farm and the history and into how, how do we produce 70 to 100 percent more food? I pulled some data from the Canadian Census of Agriculture and looked at uh, 
productivity of Canadian farmland starting in 1971 through uh, 2011, and uh, soon I will have to update uh, the, uh, the 2016 Ag Census. But, but what we see is a, a continually increasing trend. There was a, a blip there in the drought of the early 2000s, uh, but really today producing you know over 180 percent of what we produced in 1971, which when we look at the, the, the goal or target that the UN set of 70 to 100 percent increase in food production by 2050, you go, you know, maybe we can do that, which which I think is, is particularly from a social perspective, uh, a very good thing. So I'm going to look now at, at three different production systems that, that I, I uh, often hear um, espoused as how we should farm uh, farmland in, in Prairie Canada. And the first one of those is a, an extensification model. <clears throat> and I use the photo from the, the 70s or 80s uh, to, to, to illustrate that because really the extensified model um, is one that relies on lower inputs and with organic being probably the extreme of that. Um, and that, that lower input then re requires uh, tillage as, as a means of weed control because of uh, a lower amount of inputs being used. And often, um, you know, usually I've delivered this presentation to, to agricultural audiences. It's interesting delivering this to the conservation group today. But, um, but those lower inputs often are, are espoused by, by uh, conservationists because it, it feels like probably the safer thing because there's less uh, artificial uh, things being put into the environment. One of the things that, that is a, a direct relationship, though, that, that often we don't think about is systems that are highly reliant on tillage as a means of weed control. Uh, generally have very poor soil health because that tillage breaks down soil aggregates, um, does not allow organic material to accumulate in the soil, which results in not only loss of uh, greenhouse gases, but, uh, but uh, decreased uh, soil, soil stability and soil aggregation, as I talked about earlier. So if we, if we took a look at, at how would we produce, even what we produce today, um, based on that Ag Census data, um, using uh, an extensified production system. So, and I use 1981 as kind of the, the representative year for that level of productivity. It means we'd have to increase the area under production of crops by 38%. So to produce, just to say that again, to produce what we produce today using 2011 agricultural production system under 1981 farming methods, we need 38% more land under cultivation, and that would have to come from habitat lands or, or, uh, or trees and, and that sort of thing. And, and simply put, we don't have that much uh, farmable land that's not being farmed. But geographically, that would be like bringing the cropped area of Manitoba, Alberta, and Quebec into production in addition to the land that we already have under production. So if we look at the sustainability report card on that, um, socially, you know, the extensified production system is something that is uh, a comfortable thing, a positive thing to a, a, a sector of society. But I think if you look at uh, producing even as much food as we to do today, let alone more food, and, and think about global food supplies rather than do I have enough food in my own fridge and do I feel good about it, uh, it would be a fail. Looking at it from an economic perspective, uh, it's fairly well documented that small grain production under extensified production systems on the prairies is not uh, an economic uh, undertaking. Uh, our own farm, we have we bought out two two farms that were farming extensively, organically, and and uh, and it simply they just they weren't economically viable anymore. And uh, environmentally, I think we would likely all agree that increasing the crop acreage on the Canadian prairies. Uh, or in Canada by 38% would be an environmental fail. So not necessarily the report card we'd want to bring home to mom and dad. So let's move along to uh, the next uh, production system that I would argue is the, is the one that we're following today. Um, certainly when you go to areas like the Regina Plains and uh, the Red River Valley, um, basically you farm road ditch to road ditch or even edge of road to edge of road, and the road ditch is even under production. Um, and, and you know fairly high uh, inputs and that sort of thing. And this picture kind of uh, I, I included to, to demonstrate what an intensified production system might look like. 
And one of the things that uh, certainly uh, has been proven is that an intensified production system does lead to increased production. Um, it is a production system that relies on higher inputs and uh, to achieve those, those uh, outputs. And, and sometimes those higher inputs do have uh, unintended consequences, either directly on the landscape or, or downstream. Uh, the data that I've seen is that we're seeing an increased area of production somewhere in the area of 10,000 hectares per year, uh, which I think when we look at through the sustainability lens is not something that is, is sustainable. So uh, I, I used this cartoon that DU developed some time ago just to, to demonstrate how that um, increasing area under production uh, might look like. The dotted line uh, delineates what would be called the contributing area to the, the stream running through this land. Um, and if we drain those wetlands, the white dotted line uh, now demonstrates the new area of uplands which contribute water but also uh, nutrients, crop protection products, etc., into that, that running water. So, you know, look at a few different landscape impacts um, as a result of bringing that, that additional land into production through an intensified production system. And I'm going to express the impacts uh, based on linearity. So, we use 10% as an example. So, we'll pretend that the white dotted line increased the uplands contributing to runoff from the property as 10%. So, a 10% increase, for example, uh, of contributing area results in a 12% increase um, in stream flow. Hope that makes sense. Um, soil loss is, is probably the one that's, that's most staggering, where uh, a 10% increase in, uh, in contributing area results in a 27.5% increase in soil loss. Nutrient export, one which we've certainly heard lots about. Um, nitrogen. Uh, a 10% increase in contributing area would be roughly an 18% increase in nutrient export. And, and the one, gosh, it's hardly good news, but uh, the, the, the one that, that doesn't increase at a rate that's greater than, than linear is phosphorus, which uh, increases uh, equal. So a 10% increase in contributing area would result in a 10% increase in, in phosphorus export. Looking beyond that, um, we've done a little bit of work and we're actually, he was just undertaken a project with uh, Canola Council and a few other partners uh, like Bayer and Syngenta looking at crop protection products in wetlands. Um, the, the work that we've done so far has shown that there, there are nine common products that were regularly detected and most of them were kind of the usual suspects that are often applied later in the growing season like glyphosate and the metabolites of glyphosate, uh, 2,4-D and that sort of thing. Uh, and I think this is an area that, that we do need to do more work on to see um, which products are or are not ending up uh, in wetlands and if they're ending up in concentrations that are, that are of concern. Um, but certainly increasing the amount of uplands that contribute runoff, uh, leaving the property uh, in water is, is something that, that likely increases your risk of having those products end up downstream. Another one that often people don't think about, and uh, many in the agricultural community, especially uh, those of us that are no-tillers, view uh, carbon sequestration to be a uh, business opportunity moving ahead because we sequester carbon through no-till. Um, one of the things that probably people haven't thought a lot about is that when they drain a wetland, they release a considerable amount of greenhouse gases. And the, the data I've seen uh, says basically if you drain one acre of wetland on a half section, you likely broke even from a, a greenhouse gas perspective. So rather than it being a potential income source, uh, if you drain two wetlands, for example, you'd end up in a, a deficit position from a greenhouse gas perspective. And shifting gears a little bit from, from on-farm or on-field impacts to, to broader uh, industry level impacts, certainly we see market access being um, increasingly interested in, in how food is produced and the sustainability of that production. All the way from things like the, the Sustainable Ag Index platform or, or SI, um, Unilever being a, a major manufacturer that is uh, very interested in, in sustainable sourcing of, of goods, um, ISCC uh, in, in Europe, all the way down to the smaller, simpler uh, sustainability schemes like General Mills. Um, all of them having some restriction or preference for uh, goods produced uh, in, in certain ways. 
And I have to say that I was super excited this past spring. I signed my first uh, contract that actually paid for sustainability. Um, I'm not sure that it paid for much more than the stamp. It was a pretty low uh, dollar value, but it was the first time in Canada that I, or at least Western Canada, that I'd seen a payment for uh, sustainable production of, of, a, of a crop. But another thing that, that we, we hear a lot about in agriculture is, is social license and the ability to, to farm uh, without uh, a lot of oversight. And, and certainly we see uh, increasing concern from the public about how, how their food's produced and, and the perception of, of uh, agriculture, the agriculture industry, not being out, looking out for the best interest of, uh, of the people that are consuming the food that they produce. And uh, this one's my favorite one. Um, and and I, I actually, as, as someone that produces food, I look at this and go, gosh, that, that's really sad that there are people out there that, that believe that, that um, you know, food is being produced that, that is that is this bad, you know, box-raised uh, tortured chicken and, and uh, uh, human genome spliced potatoes that I think are maybe giving us the finger. Um, and, and it just, it makes me sad that that's kind of where we're at with, uh, with uh, the way food production is viewed. And I, I think when I talk to agricultural audiences, uh, one of the solutions that they give is, well, we'll just educate people on this and um, they'll, this will get better. And uh, some, some work that came out of the Oklahoma State uh, Ag Economics Department, they do an annual uh, consumer survey, a fairly intensive one in, in, in their area, looking at everything from uh, asking consumers if caloric content should be listed on restaurant meals, and should school lunches have a, a maximum caloric value, and um, should... Uh, should soda uh, with sugar in it be, be uh, taxed more heavily? And one of the questions they asked was, should food that has GMO in it be labeled? And 82% uh, of people said yes, and 18% uh, said no. It's so, okay, well, they moved on to the next question, which was, should food that has DNA in it be labeled? 80% of people said yes, and 20% said no. And I... I <laughs> When I first heard this, I was like, no, that can't be right. So I, I did a little more checking into it, and sure enough, that, that is certainly what the, 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 the survey said. So Washington Post, bless their hearts, uh, came up with a label that probably could go on food that um, can be used to, to warn people of the risks of, of DNA in their food. And I'll, I'll let you guys read that. But I, I, I did a little uh, home survey, and I asked my nieces that are in grade two and grade five, you know, do you know what DNA is? And the grade two did not know what DNA was, but the grade five actually provided a reasonable explanation of what DNA was. And I, I think it, from, from an agricultural perspective, this says, you know what, um, we probably can't educate our way out of this if people have forgotten what, what they learned in grade five. And 80% of them are concerned about, concerned about DNA in their food. Um, but I, I think from a, 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 a conservation perspective, I think there's an opportunity in here um, to maybe help uh, not confuse people any further and uh, encourage production systems that, that we think are in the best interest of the environment. So coming back to intensification, uh, I'm looking at its report card. Socially, if you're in a part of the world that just simply needs more food and maybe how it's produced is, is a second or even not a priority at all, Intensification is, is a, a positive production system from your perspective. But certainly, uh, based on, on a lot of the, the, the reactions that I showed in, 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 in pictures uh, earlier in the presentation, there are, there are a lot of people that are concerned about um, socially how, if this production system is, is uh, a positive thing on the landscape. Looking at uh, it from a, an economic perspective, uh, if, you, if you're a farmer that is able to farm row ditch to row ditch, and, and all that sort of thing, you know what, intensification is a, is a profitable production system. And when we look off-farm, though, um, whether it be someone that is downstream that is uh, getting your excess water, whether it is uh, a city that's having to deal with uh, issues due to nutrients that have come downstream or, or other things, or, or whether it's uh, municipalities that have uh, infrastructure that's failing because of increased stream flow, you know, 
it is not a, a, a pass, it's a fail. So much like the social one, uh, intensification gets a pass fail on, on the economic side of things. And environmentally, I think, again, we would likely all agree that uh, farming fence row to fence row uh, with high, high levels of inputs is, is, is not a pass, it's a fail. So the, the last system I wanted to talk about uh, in the presentation today is one called sustainable intensification. And this grew out of academia. The, the furthest back I can see references to were, were 10 years ago, but it could certainly be longer than that. And really, uh, it's a production system that tries to embrace uh, a few different things. And one of the things that it has embraced is, yes, we need to produce more. It, it, it accepts and recognizes that um, we are going to see 70 to 100 percent increase in demand in food, and we need to, to produce uh, that food to, to ensure that people don't go hungry. But rather than focused on high inputs uh, to maximize production, it looks at increased input efficiency. Um, so there are a few production systems that have that have looked at that. Um, the U.S. field to market um, effort, as well as the Canadian field print initiative look at uh, efficiency of various inputs as a means of measuring sustainability. Now, and I'll use uh, nitrogen fertilizer, for example. Um, so if a person were at 100 units of, of nitrogen and applied 20 more units, for example, and only saw a 10% increase in productivity, so they applied 20% more but only gained 20% in productivity, that would be a, a fail. Whereas if they decrease nitrogen by 10%, and only saw a 5% decrease in, uh, in, in productivity, <coughs> pardon me, that, that would be a pass. So far, most of the, the things that we've seen is actually there is a benefit uh, to increasing inputs to a certain point uh, beyond where we are today. Um, but and, and decreasing inputs often resulted in negative efficiency gains. Um, but currently, Field to Market and Canadian Field Print Initiative measure uh, nutrients, soil loss, greenhouse gases, and water. So they've got a few indicators. They are currently working on a biodiversity indicator as well, which is difficult because it's not as easily measured as um, as soil loss. But uh, it's something that, that I think is a, an interesting step forward and I think a very progressive step forward. And I think one of the things that sustainable intensification has really challenged people to do is rethink how food's produced and bring the environmental impact into, into a higher focus. And it also has, uh, has brought together conventional and alternate ag production systems. And the example I would use here is uh, cover crops, which five years ago, I would imagine very few of us would have heard of cover crops because they were largely something used in uh, organic production systems to compete with weeds and attempt to keep the soil from blowing. And, uh, some bright person uh, thought about growing them in areas with longer growing seasons in particular uh, after they harvested their crop as a means of uh, intercepting nutrients uh, and improving soil uh, structure. And cover crops have now become a, a fairly popular thing. Not widely adopted in Prairie Canada because uh, we have the issue of winter coming very close after harvest and, and having trouble establishing cover crops, but there's certainly work ongoing on that. But I think it's a great example of where um, different ag production systems were brought together to hopefully find a, a better solution. Um, this is a, a, a map, it's called a profit surface, that, um, that is generated uh, through precision agriculture and it shows varying levels of profit or loss on a, a quarter section of land where the, the red in this example is a losing anywhere between 41 and $264 per square on, on the uh, on the quarter section, and the green making anywhere from 150 to 327 dollars per per square. And I think this is a a place where, where precision agriculture is headed. It's going to take a while to get there, but where when you look at this, there are certain areas that you would be money ahead by not farming. And I, I think as the 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 data pools become larger and we have multiple years of data, um, we will see farmers start to think about um, addition through subtraction on their farm and possibly uh, taking areas of their farm and growing other things like environmental goods and services on there rather than losing money growing growing crops on them. But 
it'll take some a, a while to get there. But I, I think there are certainly uh, there are certainly steps being made in that regard. Canola Council's currently got a project with uh, with Agrium Fertilizer and the University of Alberta working on on a, this exact project, taking farm data and, and looking at what areas are making versus losing money. So looking at the report card for sustainable intensification socially, uh, I would give it a pass because it does uh, embrace the increased productivity, but I think it also uh, does take into consideration the, the concerns that people may have about how their food is produced. Economically, because we look at uh, uh, overall input efficiency rather than just input levels, it, uh, it potentially has a, a pass on that regard. And environmentally, um, because it, it does not uh, support bringing new land into production, uh, I, th I think it's potentially a pass there as well. So uh, in, in wrapping up my, my presentation, um, I, I think I, I'm very encouraged with where where agriculture is, is headed from a conservation perspective. I think the opportunity has never been better than it is today. Um, the sustainability movement in Canada is, you know, it's hit some bumps in the road, I would say, um, but and we are certainly behind um, many other places in the world, like Europe and even the U.S. But I, I think we are we're making ground, and we're at least uh, having the discussion about how to how to improve the sustainability of crop production in Canada. Um, recently, we've seen much more. Uh, pragmatic engagement by, by ENGOs in the discussion with, with crop groups. Um, last spring, I, I helped co-organize a, a meeting between industry and uh, a few ENGOs, it was the EU, uh, WWF, and uh, the Nature Conservancy, or Nature Conservancy Canada. And um, afterwards, uh, we asked everyone in the group to say, well, you know, what did you think about it? And it was, it was interesting because the, the ag group said, well, gosh, we've, we've never met with, with many of these, these folks. And, this was a really good discussion. It was really, really positive and, and, and pragmatic. And I, I think the Engos had, had a similar response to the discussion. You know, egg wasn't as hard to work with as we thought they would be. But I think that increased pragmatism and engagement of looking for a solution on a shared landscape rather than fighting over what the landscape might look like is, is a very positive uh, step. I, I believe that from, from my work with industry that at the industry level, and when I say the industry level, I mean uh, senior management of many of our, our uh, agricultural companies, as well as uh, industry organizations like Crop of Canada and Fertilizer Canada, uh, they are largely there on the idea of environmental sustainability as part of the, the crop production system. But I think it's also important to remember that perspective is everything. And as you move uh, in agricultural or ag industry companies closer to the farm gate, um, that that acceptance that we need to think about environment and economic uh, becomes a little bit cloudier. And certainly it is hard to argue with someone who says, well, you know, I make more money by farming more land. Um, and generally, uh, our society has been motivated by self-interest. So um, I, I think we've got some work to do um, getting that message to, to the farm gate. But I think that uh, the fact that the industry is, is moving in that direction is something that I at least find very positive. So I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, I think I came in close to on target for time. So uh, I, I don't know, Ian, if we have time for a few questions, I'd be happy to try and answer some. Sure. And if anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to type them in, and I'll uh, let Paul know what they are. Got a couple people typing here, Paul. Okay, here's a question. Do you think a sustainability movement needs to be farmer-led, research-led, or government-led? And what incentives need to be included? Okay, um, so the sustainability movements in Canada and the U.S. have been uh, industry and farmer-led and government-supported. And the governments in Canada and the U.S. have both consciously said they do not want to drive, they want to support. Um, I, I would say that 
I guess it depends what you mean by incentives. Um, unfortunately, um, right now, one of the big hangups for, for uh, the, the farming community is that they perceive the sustainability movement to be a cost to them with no benefit, or at least no economic benefit, um, because rarely have we seen a financial premium for producing goods uh, under sustainable management systems rather than uh, regular. And at best, it gains you a little bit of market access. So that's certainly been a, a, a hurdle with, with, uh, with farmers because, of course, no one's looking to add extra costs with no benefit to their company operation. Um, and I hope that that's one that we can get past. But that's certainly been one of the big challenges we've seen um, in, the, in the near term anyway. Okay, uh, we have one more question. Uh, could cropping sector uh, meet biodiversity demands by supporting grasslands and forage producers in various ways? I'm not sure I understand what that question means. <laughs> uh, Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, could the could you please clarify your question? Um, okay. That's sustainable. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So. If certainly grasslands and forages are, are an important part of a sustainable landscape. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I, don't, I don't know how to, how to, how to frame it best. Um, the beef folks and the crop folks have worked separately on, on their sustainability uh, programs. And also, the crops folks have worked separate from the horticulture folks and, and the vegetable producers. And I think it was done to chop the pieces up into things that weren't completely impossible to, to tackle. Um, if, if one were to accept that, that part of sustainability is not bringing more land into production, the, the remnant habitat that's out there certainly does produce uh, biodiversity, at, at least in my understanding. and. Uh, if some of those areas that weren't financially viable were taken out of annual crop production, that would certainly also help produce uh, some environmental goods. I guess I would disagree partially with your last sentence that you wrote there, that the cropping sector doesn't produce biodiversity or wildlife habitat, because there certainly is, uh, based on information I've seen, there is um, environmental habitat or environmental value and uh, wildlife habitat provided by some crops, certainly. Um, I guess in any fall sown crop I've seen provides good uh, nesting habitat for upland nesting birds. Um, and certainly um, we see lots of other animals using um, cropland as a portion of the habitat that they require. Hope that I answered your question. Okay, it looks like we have one final question coming in, and then we'll have to. Uh and the questions for uh, today's presentation. Maybe while that, that question is being typed, I'll just mention um, biodiversity was not in the first round of um, things that the market demanded as far as sustainability went, which is, you know, a very sad thing for those of us that work for, for, for ENGOs. Um, they, the big focal things were, of course, climate change, water quality, and um, efficiency of, of inputs that are being used. Um, 
On the positive side, both field to market and Canadian field print initiatives, second round of priorities have been biodiversity. So I think that that's a positive step, but I think a, a reality that we live in that biodiversity wasn't number one, it was down the chain a little bit. Uh, okay, uh, Crystal's question. There is research to suggest that livestock integration would also be better a better way to manage land, better for biodiversity and soils. Any thoughts for the prairies? Uh, yeah, there, there, there certainly is evidence that having having a mixed farm like all of our great grandparents did is better than than the, the specialization that we see today. Um, I heard an interesting presentation by uh, some of you may have heard of Dave Brown from uh, North Dakota. Um, a, a farmer that's done a lot of work on, on soil quality, soil health, and that sort of thing. And I think that Dave had a very pragmatic thought that it is unlikely that the 30,000 acre farmer is going to run out and, and uh, purchase cows to, to manage their farm differently. And it is also unlikely that the person with four or 500 head is going to become a grain farmer. We need to find a way to make business integrate rather than having farms diversify if that makes sense, because it just, it, it, today's economics don't seem to, to encourage people to do that. So it, it, it might take a different economic model than, than having everyone go back to being a mixed farm. But um, certainly having heard uh, and seen some of the stuff that's going on in Gabe's farm where he has uh, uh, made uh, grazing back part of his crop production system where those uh, cover crops are being able to produce an economic value as well as an environmental value. I, I, I think, yes, that's a great idea. I think it is going to take a while to figure out how to make that work on the prairies. Okay, great. If anybody else has any additional questions, you can uh, send them to me and I can certainly uh, get them to Paul and he can answer them for you later. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your informative presentation. Thank you to everyone who joined us today for our first webinar. Uh, our next, please join us for our next webinar on November 15th for uh, Dr. Uh, John Pomeroy's webinar on Global Water Futures Program. Again, thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everybody.